The chassis is often the first things teams design in the beginning of their build season. However, today we're going to be going over a specific kind of chassis design, which we call the modular encapsulation chassis for the first robotics competition. This chassis is unique because it serves as a simple design solution that would meet most drivetrain needs in most seasons. Its easily adaptable design strategy can be implemented simplistically into most FRC games. This can greatly speed up initial season prototyping and serve as an elegant solution to electrical and control system organization. Now, let's talk about what actually goes into this chassis. We have at the center, the main structural component, our motion component, various 3D printed parts, our electrical components, including the power distribution hub, our battery, our rubber rio, and more as well as a top and bottom plate. This is actually the namesake for the chassis as it emulates encapsulation. We'll talk about that later. Let's talk about that structural component first. Obviously with every game, it's subject to change to fit the needs of the game or the goals of the team. Now, the overall perimeter of the structure doesn't have to be rectangular. Various inlets can be shortened, widened, you can add another, or even remove it altogether. The possibilities are endless. Feel free to be creative with the shape of your chassis, but make sure to keep it practical too. There's really no limitation in the kind of drive system you could use as well. Here's a special kind of swerve drive that's mounted within pieces of tubing, as well as tank drive and mechnum drive, as well as various other drives used within the first robotics competition. Extrusion is one of the most common structural elements used on your robot. Here is an example of a rectangular profile, but they can also come in round profiles and other special kinds of profiles. But not every piece of extrusion is built the same. If you compare the tubings on the right and the left, the left one includes a standard rectangular profile, while the right one includes corner bracing that reduces shearing. Some vendors even do pre-drilled holes along the faces of the tube. The reason why extrusion is so common within the first robotics competition is because extrusions can be sourced very easily from vendors, usually at cheap prices. They can also be manipulated using basic shop materials, which makes it a go-to for rookie teams and even veteran teams as well. The only downside is that when you're limited to specific profiles and lengths, it can very much hinder creative freedom when it comes to various design choices you have to make within your robot. Some teams have to make sacrifices every year because of this limitation. This leads us to the next method, which is sheet metal. The premise is really simple. Imagine you take a flat piece of sheet metal and you draw some imaginary lines and you bend the metal along those lines. Let's apply this to something a little bit more practical. Say we take a long piece of sheet metal and then we draw two lines along the long edge. When we bend those inwards, you can kind of see it makes the letter C, but backwards. But if you put two of those together, you can kind of see how it mimics that same rectangular profile used within our extrusion. Put those together, and you can actually create 90 degree angles using sheet metal tabs and bolting them together using fasteners or even welding. Repeat this process, and you have what looks like a chassis. Here's another example. Because sheet metal comes in flat stock, you can use CNC machinery to actually cut out custom profiles on said piece of sheet metal. You can then bend that after the fact and create your very own custom part. Now, there are some pros and cons to using sheet metal on your robot. The obvious pro is that it allows you to create much more complex geometries, which allows you to solve design problems in a much more creative manner. The easy implementation of CNC allows you to create holes for either fastening, or lightening much, much easier. Now, teams don't always have the resources to create sheet metal parts. This can be hardware, whereas they don't have a CNC roll break and shear, or a CNC router, which allows them to cut through metal parts. It's also a completely different CAD workflow to learn, which is a whole other obstacle when it comes to creating complex geometry. Your robot functionality is realized through your electrical system which is characterized by standard crucial FRC parts. Of these crucial parts, one of the most important is your power distribution hub. You'll see a positive and a negative port, as well as various other ports for different kinds of fuses for different amp needs. For lower voltage applications, such as 5 volts, 
you'll sometimes need to use a voltage regulator module to power these parts. And of course, the source of all of your power, a standard 12 volt FRC battery. Be sure to leave room for a circuit breaker in an easy to reach visible position. All of your power runs directly from the battery through the circuit breaker into the power distribution hub. When it comes to robot control, the most important piece is your Robo Rio. This is the brain of your robot, where all of your code is stored and where the robot is ultimately controlled from. Driver and robot interactions happen through the radio, a standard piece of FRC hardware. The radio module requires both an ethernet and a power port. Because power cords are prone to being pulled, an external module can be added to pull power from the ethernet cord rather than a power cord. The benefit of this is that an ethernet cord is kept in the port through a mechanical latch. This way, it can't be pulled during a match. When using pneumatic components on your robot, be sure to include a pneumatic hub which controls the solenoids on your robot. Some teams choose to put a compressor onto their robot as well to keep a standard 60 PSI within all of their pneumatic networks. Don't forget all the different kinds of sensors that you can also put onto your robot. Just to name a few, there are some visual sensors, such as a camera, distance sensors, such as LiDAR, and gyroscopes, such as the one seen on the right. Camera sensors are especially useful due to the fact that they can be used for vision detection. However, this is a pretty taxing process from a memory point of view. So, you're actually able to include coprocessors onto your robot that can aid with processing as to not overload the RoboRio. Special sensors can be purchased with a coprocessor included within. That way, a separate coprocessor component isn't needed on the robot. 3D printing is one of the most versatile technologies FRC teams have at their disposal. With chassis design, here are a couple very important parts that you should consider printing. One is a swerve guard. When using swerve modules mounted at the corners of your chassis, it's entirely possible that cables can get caught up in the swerve treads. But by 3D printing these two inch tall swerve guards, they can mount within the two inches of chassis. And don't forget battery cleats. The battery cleats are designed to fit specifically within the upper voids of your battery. This keeps the battery from moving around within the robot, especially if it's laying straight down. Up to this point, I've been explaining a pretty standard FRC chassis. None of this information is new or revolutionary. However, the one thing that separates a modular encapsulation chassis from a standard chassis is the word encapsulation. First, let's go over how to actually organize the electrical components onto an example chassis. First, we have to mark the corners of where our swerve drive modules are going, and feel free to do the same for tank drive or magnum drive or various other drive systems. Next, map out your other major electrical components that take up more space and weigh much more, such as the power distribution hub and the battery, possibly one of the heaviest components on your robot. Next, group your control systems together, such as your Robo Rio and your radio, seeing as they're connected through the ethernet port. If applicable, be sure to group your pneumatic pieces together as well. Also be sure to include sensors such as a gyroscope, which typically work best when placed in the center of the robot. When we place a bottom plate on this chassis, you can kind of see how it all comes together. Yet one of the strengths of a chassis is having accessible components at all times for various maintenance and improvement. So say you had some kind of superstructure on top of your chassis, you then eliminate the ability for you to work on those specific components. And placing your component on top of that superstructure then defeats the purpose of a centrally organized control system. So we offer a different solution, mounting your components upside down. That way their top accessible portion is actually on the bottom of your chassis. Your bottom plate then becomes a top plate where the components actually mount to. This actually provides square support, acting as a gusset for your entire chassis. You can then add an actual bottom plate. When cutting out accessible lightning holes, as well as other mounting holes, feel free to follow this strategy. Mark out the locations of your larger components. We can remove a lot of geometry this way. Next, mark out the location of your battery. This is where you might need to access it. Next, mark out any diagonal support you'll need to maintain on your plate. This is the portion of the plate you want to keep for structural purposes. Your final part should look something like this. We can repeat this methodology for the top plate, 
And be sure to account for components that are taller than two inches, or whatever the thickness of your chassis is, such as your compressor or your battery. Now, you might be wondering, how do I even attach a superstructure to this chassis? Say, at this point, or this point. Using this example, we have four possible mounting points. If we zoom in on this corner, we can actually add a gusset plate and mount it using fasteners to secure it to the main chassis. You can also use L brackets to mount pieces at 90 degrees or any other angle provided by specific kinds of brackets. But what if we wanted a superstructure that actuated from the chassis, such as this pivoting arm? Your gussets can look a little something like this. See how it captures the arms on both sides of the chassis? You can then use fasteners to secure it to the actual chassis tubing by putting a fastener directly through the piece of tubing or capturing it from above or below. Here's another real life example. The circular parts of these gussets are actually hinging points and you can see the various fastener holes located on there as well. With this example, we actually wanted multiple rotating axles around the same location. This proves that you can actually mix multiple functions into one plate. Now, you're probably wondering, what about motor controllers or solenoids or other pieces that directly control our robot? These components are unique simply due to the fact that they take up much more space on the robot. There are plenty of creative ways that you can mount these. Here are two simple examples. You can, say, construct walls out of aluminum tubing and using polycarbonate plates, you can attach your motor controllers and your solenoids to the polycarbonate plates. With a more low profile solution, you can attach your components to polycarbonate plates and attach them back to your chassis using standoffs. We're excited to see what kind of creative solutions you can come up with using the modular encapsulation chassis. From Team 4611, onward and upward.